It's fantastic to be here. I'm Daniel. I'm a rocket scientist at heart. And I want to show you why space is no longer reserved for the billionaires as a playground or the governments to do some shady and crazy stuff up there. So let's talk a little about space. Why do we do space at all? Why go to space? And I want to start with what actually do people associate with space? And oftentimes we would think about, you know, building satellites. And this is also what the majority of the people actually think. It's like putting satellites into space. Many of you have actually no idea what the satellites do in space. Going to Moon and Mars is a very, very big thing, because obviously when you stand at night on the outside and you take a look at the glazing stars, um, you would actually see satellites, but obviously you also see the moon and the sun, etc. Now, what's a little bit more interesting is that about a fifth of people associate with aliens. Because, you know, it's coming from the outside and we actually would like to preserve our small, tiny, little, cozy planet. And then, why actually only 10% Star Wars? I think that should be more like 70%. So, space is actually not, as I said, the one playground for some tourists to go to space uh, who have too much money in their pockets. But why we really need space is because we need it to actually manage our planet. So about 90, 95% of the entire space industry really is focused on making life better on Earth. That could be anything from connectivity, beaming internet down from space, or it could be Earth observation to actually tell us when and where to harvest our crop, or how much water we actually need to put on an agricultural field. And so, more and more also in the last about five years, what we've seen is there's plenty of startups building satellites and satellite constellations. Now, one of the questions which probably many of you, but as well as uh, many, many other founders in this planet, ask themselves is, how does the world actually look like in the future? And what could be my role in that? I think that in about 20 years, every device on this planet will be connected. Now, that actually might sound reasonable, but if you think that about three and a half billion people on this planet do not have access to internet as of today, it actually is quite a challenge. Obviously, we're going to spend a lot of resources on tackling climate change. And actually, let's go a step back. Why do we even know there's climate change? It's not that. Probably if you would ask a few politicians, they would tell you, oh, it, there's data on the internet which tells you. But where does data actually come from? And satellites actually are generating more than half of all the data based on which we actually determine how the health of this planet looks like, what we need to do in order to make sure that we preserve it or can make it better. And over the course of the last few months, we've also seen more and more and more that uh, we're already actually in a tech and talent war. And basically that political, geopolitical tensions are quite important, whereas over the course of the last few years, uh, we've been living in a quite nice and calm planet. But then again, space is actually already a playground also for the militaries and defense ministries of the world. So, what do satellites have to do with this? A satellite flies in space. Now the question is, where actually is space? And per definition, it is at pretty much starting at exactly 100 kilometers of altitude. Now, you can throw something up into space. I could throw up this thing up to 100 kilometers. And what would happen is the thing would pretty much exactly fall down from where I threw it up. So objects and satellites stay in space because we accelerate them to an orbital speed, which is at a low Earth orbit of about 500 kilometers of altitude, about 28,000 kilometers an hour. And that's also what we do with these are we build the rockets in order to accelerate the satellites. Now, if the satellite is flying at 28,000 kilometers an hour, it's circumferencing the entire planet in 90 minutes. So every one and a half hours, you do an entire Earth rotation with your satellite, which is great because the founders among you are thinking, oh, I can serve the entire planet with my first satellite already. Whether I gather the data in Helsinki or in the US, or in Asia, or in Africa, it doesn't matter because the satellite is 
pretty much orbiting the planet over and over and over again for many, many years, gathering valuable information. Now, if you multiply that single satellite and basically create a mesh of satellites, such that at any point in time, you always have a satellite exactly above you, generating data or providing a service from space, you basically come up with a satellite constellation. So in the past, we've built single-off, one-off satellites. As of today, most of the companies and startups in space are building big constellations to provide a real-time service on a global scale from day one. Now, there's one single thing where, regardless of the application that you do in space, you have to go through, and that is the launch. So whether a satellite actually does telecoms or Earth observation, you have to first get the satellites into space, and this is also the role, again, that we at ESAR do. Now, interestingly, and probably many of you might not even know this, is that the piece on the on this uh, continent over the course of the last seven months, luckily, has been preserved due to satellites. Because the entire communications was actually one of the first systems which was brought down uh, from the Russians in Ukraine. But luckily, Ukrainians had access to a satellite constellations that would literally beam down internet from space with super low latencies. Um, and you could have 200, 300 megabit per second of internet with a super small antenna about the size of a paper. Now, this obviously changes then the entire course sometimes of humanity, whereas some people do have access to space and some others don't. But the important thing is we're trying to use space for the peace of humanity and for making sure that we can actually live on this planet for longer than just the next 50 years until hopefully we're not going to destroy this planet uh, with all our emissions, but really make sure that we create also a thriving commercial industry from it. So the entire industry is expected to go significantly to more than 3x of uh, where we are today to above a trillion. Uh, we're actually right, already right now approaching half a, billion, uh, half a trillion of uh, revenue within the space industries. Now, if you take a look at a satellite, what you see is basically electronics. The smallest standardized satellite is just 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters. So basically, half of a shoebox. And you could literally go online right now with your phone on website of European companies and order your satellite components, get it into the basket, and order your satellite at home or to your company. That's not something which was available even just five years ago. Now we have university spin-offs create huge companies. Actually, ISAI being here a spin-off of the university in Helsinki. And it's also no wonder that actually, over the course of the last four years, due to that access to technology, we really have seen a major spike in satellites going to space. And again, it's not just for governments or for billionaires, but it's for startups with investors who are here and who have already successfully funded many, many satellites, constellations, for example, that we really define a new operating system for planet Earth from space. Now, as you can also see, almost all satellites which were launched to space over the course of the last year were super tiny satellites. So 600 kilogram satellites, that's a little bit bigger than a fridge. And really going down to a small standardized satellites which you can just buy online. Now, what we do with ESAR? We build the rockets to get all of those small satellites into space. The rocket is actually Europe's largest and most powerful privately developed rocket. We're fully privately financed, and we're designing it to carry up to 1,000 kilograms into space, whether it's for Earth observation satellites to tell us where and when we harvest crop. How do you actually measure methane or CO2 on a global scale? Again, here, you're not going to put a CO2 sensor every 100 meters across the entire planet. It's just not sustainable. But what you can do is you put a satellite into space, which is monitoring and through a hyperspectral camera, uh, detecting methane, detecting water, water vapor, detecting CO2. And then basically you have an overall global map. With more satellites you put into space as part of a constellation, you can increase your resolution both time-wise but as well as um, geospatially. And so you can really create a global map 
which is something that we need if we really want to tackle climate change sophistically and uh, with actual data instead of just beliefs. Now, these are what we also do is uh, we actually employ a rocket propellant that you have at your own home in your own refrigerator. So we use highly clean propane, which actually was quite a challenge because it's burning too cleanly. So we don't have any soot uh, within our combustion. And so again, here, trying to make the world a better place and a cleaner place. What we believe also is that space is not going to be sustainable if you just keep building two rockets a year, three rockets a year. That's pretty much what actually Europe has been doing over the last decades. We've employed tens of thousands of people to build two or three rockets a year. And so if we really want to build that operating system in space for our planet Earth, what we need to have is launch capacity. And launch capacity comes through a lot of rocket launches at the end of the day. So what we do at ESAR is we automate the manufacturing and basically take knowledge that we usually would have in the automotive industry or in the aircraft industry and employ it within the space industry. And so to give you maybe two examples, we can build a rocket engine from raw material to a finished rocket engine in about two weeks of time. Compare that to a classically designed and driven industry where it would take them about one and a half years to go from a raw material to a finished rocket engine. We do a lot of metal 3D printing. Um, we do carbon fiber winding for the entire structures, such that we'll literally have two people uh, in our manufacturing facility supervising the build of multiple rockets at the same time. Now, that's also not something where usually would actually think that you would get funding for out of Europe. But over the course of the last two years, really, we've managed to go from zero, with literally zero experience on manufacturing, for example, to becoming probably the most sophisticated manufacturer within the space industry within Europe. So as of today, we already have a capacity with about 50 people on ground of outputting more than 10x the amount of systems and components than the entire European industry combined over the course of the last year. And so, a founder or an idea can not only disrupt very small parts of this planet, but I also dare you to think big. And the next item I'm going to show you is because one of the biggest challenges that we had is how do we actually get 100 million plus of venture capital financing pre-revenue? And actually, the first question that usually we got from investors about three, four years ago was, what did you guys smoke? And people were just completely crazy, said, oh, you're building rockets, you're like, please go to some other, it's not part of our investment uh, scheme, you're completely outside the box, we really like you, but it's not something for us. So at the same time, we also couldn't just go to all the international VCs and then go talk to European governments and tell, hey, you should launch your rockets with us while 80% of our cap table actually is non-European. So we went on a challenge to say, is it possible to actually raise 100 million plus out of Europe from European investors for something that no one of them ever did actually before? And the good thing is, it does work. So even if you have super crazy ideas, don't give up on the fundraising part. We've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of investors, such that at the end of the day, we found the right ones for us, who are really bold thinkers as well. The Lake Stars, the Early Birds, who, by the way, all are here today. So big thank you to also the investors among you who believe in big and bold ideas. Now, where do we go in the future? Space is something which still today is not in the mouth of everyone. But you're already today dependent on the entire space industry, whether it's the blue dot on your phone which guided you yesterday morning and this morning to this venue. It is connectivity, as I said, for the 3 billion people who today don't have internet access. It's also no wonder why all the big corporates are investing billions into their own space programs. Amazon, Vodafone, John Deere, why does actually a, why does a tractor company use space? 
And so John Deere, for example, is a very interesting case because they actually already guide their tractors fully autonomously through GPS. On the other side, they're now expanding that to bring in agricultural data, have a machine learning algorithm tell them when and where to put how much water, to put how much fertilizer, such that actually they found out with half the water and half the fertilizer, if you dose it and apply it in the right way, you can actually double your output. And so what we're seeing is that many other industries are getting disrupted through space. It's the automotive industry, too. How, do, how are we going to get to autonomous driving? Your car will always have to actually send up a signal of uh, when and where it is going and where it is. Also, did you ever think about how do we find pirates? Like, these are the crazy questions we'd ask ourselves is, how do we actually know there's pirates, but also how do we find them? Again, here, it is satellite constellations, actually from European startups, who basically have a signal detected from ships, and whenever pirates would take over a ship, they turn off that signal. Now, if you overlay that data, for example, through companies like data from the companies like ISI, uh, you can still track those ships with a radar satellite through nighttime as well as when there's clouds. But then you can actually track the pirates, and when they took over a ship, send the info uh, to the naval coast, for example. And so, Space data is already today everywhere. There's no single bank transaction or no ATM withdrawal happening without space access and space data. And we're also not going to fix space. Um, uh, we're not going to fix climate change without space data. And so it is a super exciting industry, one to definitely look out for. But last but not least, I really want to encourage you, if you think your idea is big, think bigger. And the best thing is that it's definitely doable in Europe, too. Thank you very much.